Trophy Hunting in North America Most of the intense controversy over trophy hunting focuses on African hunting experiences. Images of lions, rhinos, and Cape buffalo may readily come to mind. Yet this kind of selective hunting occurs in many parts of the world and is applied to many different wildlife species. Furthermore, the conservation benefits of trophy hunting have been recognized globally in places as different as Namibia to Pakistan. Nowhere, however, is there a longer history between conservation and trophy hunting than in the United States and in North America more generally. Many of us are aware of the broad misconceptions among non-hunters and within the hunting community itself about big game trophies and hunting. Further, many of us are aware that some organized groups who wish to end all hunting have attempted to influence the public, policymakers, and the media by presenting a negative image of trophy hunting. The images they present, however, are frequently inaccurate and often deliberately misleading. Trophy hunting, the selective taking of mature male animals, has played an important role in North American conservation since the end of the 19th century. Early settlers in the New World had mistakenly believed that North America's wildlife resources were limitless and therefore inexhaustible. The result was that by the mid to late 1800s, many North American wildlife species teetered on the brink of extinction. The Boone and Crockett Club, North America's oldest wildlife conservation organization, was founded by conservation greats Theodore Roosevelt and George Bird Grinnell in 1887. Alarmed by America's wildlife depletions, they sought to promote the conservation and management of wildlife, especially big game, and its habitat. It was in this context that the selective harvest of mature male animals emerged as a critical component of the club's efforts to establish greater conservation awareness and to practically assist in wildlife conservation in North America. They recognized that in order to facilitate species recovery and prevent future threats to entire populations, one of the most important things to encourage was a sustainable harvest that protected the core of a wild breeding population. This meant protecting females and younger males while focusing the harvest on older male animals that had already contributed their genes to the population. To encourage this policy, the club established the Big Game Records program and published its first manual on measuring big game in 1906. And it referred to these record book animals as trophies. To sportsmen then and now, a mature male with large antlers or horns is considered a fine and coveted specimen. However, these animals are also proof of successful wildlife management policies and evidence that a personal conservation ethic helped guide the hunter's choice since he or she might have harvested any legal animal, regardless of sex or age or size, but chose not to, voluntarily restricting their options to only the older males of the species they hunted, now referred to as trophies. In concert with this selective harvest approach, the Boone and Crockett Club also promoted the principle of responsible ethical hunting, known as fair chase, which defined how game should be hunted in support of conservation efforts. This overarching principle emphasized that hunting should be more about the effort involved and the quality of the experience and of the game taken, rather than the number of animals harvested. And this was in complete opposition to the commercial market hunting that had decimated North American wildlife populations. Hunters were then required to verify that they had adopted fair chase principles in order for their trophy to be recognized in the club's big game records book. Through these and other related efforts in the early 20th century, North American wildlife populations recovered to the abundance and variety we see today. Tremendous examples of wildlife recovery supported and implemented by hunters and hunter-based conservation organizations can be found in North America's white-tailed deer, 
elk, and bighorn sheep populations, to name a few. And in every instance, the policy of selective harvest of mature males has assisted in the species' recovery. Older, more mature animals usually have the largest antlers or horns, and typically they are also more wary and elusive and harder to harvest. Hunting such animals under fair chase conditions often reduces the hunter's likelihood of success. However, by requiring more skill and self-discipline, a fair chase hunt, whether successful or not, came to represent a greater personal achievement. These motivations help explain why trophy hunting became popular in the 20th century. Though often described as such, trophy hunting is not really a particular form of hunting, but a, a broad term that loosely describes the intent of some hunters to selectively pursue only a particular class of animal, regardless of species and regardless of their legal right to take other sex and age classes. It is not always easy, therefore, to identify what the public perceives as trophy hunting or not. Hunting is still practiced by millions of people worldwide, including more than 15 million citizens in the United States and Canada. What particular animal each person chooses to hunt often varies with the hunter's age and experience and the geographical abundance and availability of the hunted species. Many hunters consider the animals they harvest as trophies regardless of the animal size. And this means that the term trophy hunter is ambiguous and open to interpretation. Those who are opposed to the idea of trophy hunting often rely on a divide and conquer strategy which presents the narrative that people who hunt for trophies are unethical, their actions and motivations unacceptable and cruel, and that trophy hunting can be singled out from hunting as a whole and should be legislated away. It seems that most criticisms of trophy hunting focus on the ethics, actions, and motivations of individuals rather than the actual welfare of wildlife. Hunters, whether defined specifically as trophy hunters or not, do not all fit a single mold. While there is likely to be an occasional bad apple in any barrel, most hunters are deeply concerned with the well-being and therefore the conservation of wildlife. An outdoor and hunting lifestyle fosters an appreciation of something greater than oneself. It teaches respect for nature and for the wildlife being pursued. Keeping antlers, horns, and mounted trophies is part of the tradition of hunting worldwide. These mementos are perceived by the hunter to represent a special connection with nature and to be a reminder of a memorable outdoor experience as well as a lasting tribute to a wild animal. The reality is that regardless of what individual hunters choose to do personally, whether at home or while hunting in distant locales, calls for blanket bans on trophy hunting and the importation of legally harvested animal trophies not only threaten a significant proven mechanism for wildlife conservation in places like Africa, but also in North America, a continent where wildlife thrives and conservation has realized so many successes.